got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends, burden in bitterness. You can just keep it moving. Nah, you ain't welcome here. Are you thankful this morning? If you're not thankful for what God has done, then you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> you can be seated. And uh, as the prayer teams come forward, we're going to dismiss the children uh, from junior high and down to the meeting room. Uh, junior high and up can stay in. And uh, now's the time. If you have anything to bring to the altar, they are here to pray with you. Oh! 
Lord, we thank you for the ultimate example. No greater love is known than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And Lord, not only did you lay down your life, but you bore the weight of our sins, of our shame. Lord, the things that you endured when you approached Jerusalem on that triumphant entry, it was your people that were crying out, save now, save now. And in that same vein, Lord, we are crying out to you, save now. Save now, oh God. Help us to be your hands and feet. Help us to understand the authority and the power that you have granted us that as we move, as we live and have our being, may we do so with you leading the way. God, we thank you that it's only by your power that we can come to a saving knowledge of knowing you and share you with others. In the strong and mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for all these things. And we all say, amen, amen. Praise God. Well, thank you, prayer teams. And now we have another song that we would like to do, a special, if you will. And we do ask, as the children come in to help us out with this song, please stay seated. Thank you.
Ah, did you enjoy the choir we got here today? Amen. Woo! Thank you, choir. Praise God. Thank you for the whole weekend. Amen. Hallelujah. They look good up here. If you're a first-time guest, don't think this happens every week. <laughs> but amen. Now, some of you, I know some of you said, are there that many kids in the church? Uh, I was, you know, we did it Saturday night, seemed like a long line on Saturday night. And then we did it first service, seemed like a, wow, long line. Then we did it this service. I said, is this line ever going to end? <laughs> Aren't you glad for the teachers and everybody that teaches your kids in this church? Wow. They give their time and they they pour, pour so much into them. All the people that did the uh, the Easter egg thing they had here this past week, Gail was so blessed with all the help that helped her and all the things. What a blessing. Now, we've got singers here and they've got the welcome packets in their hands. They're going to bring them right to you if this is your very first time to a service here at Crossroads. So if that's you, why don't you raise your hand where you are so we can welcome you today. Anybody here for the very first time to the service? Good to see you. Good to see you. Right here. Good to see you on the front row. Good to see you over here. <laughs> yeah, over here. Keep the hands up till they get to you. All right. Good to see you. Now, as you get that packet, you can open it up. You'll see information there about the church, but there's also an information card for you. We do ask you would fill that out for us. And at the end of our service, as you exit out the main doors to the left, there is our welcome center. Please go there. We've got a wonderful gift for you, and we're grateful, grateful to have you worshiping with us here today. All right, uh, if there's any other kids that didn't get out, you can go now. But junior high, you're staying in. Junior high, you are staying in. All right, praise God. This is our, our Palm Sunday. And let me just do a, a short little thing on the Palm Sunday is when Jesus went to Jerusalem and he rode in on a, on a donkey. And if you don't know it, that is a picture of the time that when a ruler or a king was offering peace to a city, he did not come in on the white stallion. He came on a donkey. And so it was a greater picture than what some people know, that literally the king was offering peace to the city. He was offering himself and peace. If you let me come in, if you let me reign and rule, things will uh, be a blessing to you. Now, when Jesus comes back, what does the Bible say he's on? He's on the white horse. See, that, that means it's, it's too late. If you didn't accept peace, it's too late now because the conquering king is coming. And he comes with what? All the people, the ten thousands and ten thousands upon ten thousands of his saints, all on white horses. When he says, you will reign and rule with me, when he says, you will judge angels, when he said all the kingdoms would come before you, he was telling the truth because we are on the conquering horse with our Savior. But on Palm Sunday, he offered peace. Let me tell you, while you're in this life, while you're able to breathe, while you can come into a service here today, Jesus is on the donkey. He offers us peace to our dying breath. The Bible says he desires all to be saved. He desires all to come to repentance. He's offering peace here today. He's offering a relationship with the living God. And, and that's our opportunity. Now, for this service... I had talked to my son about doing a message to us. He can't be in here because he's allergic to all of you. <laughs> Honestly, he's allergic to me. We've tried to, we've tried to clean up our house and make it a non-allergenic place. It doesn't work. It, it, he's allergic to so many things. But we believe God's got him on a path. God's got him on a path of, of correcting, of healing. And I believe one day we're going to see him right here giving us a sermon again. 
But we had planned that today he might be able to work on, on something and actually be able to say something to us in connection with Jesus offering peace. And how many of you know when they rejected Jesus, God still had a plan. When they rejected Jesus, he let him go through the biggest trial I'm sure Jesus ever went through. The one where he prayed, is there any other way? The way of the cross. The mystery of the cross. Because people didn't understand the cross they, they didn't understand. They, they, we came to take the kingdom, but now he's dying on a cross, and they were scattered, and, and after his death, they were all hiding and hiding out. It's like we've lost everything. Who knows how they all felt because their world had been so disturbed because what they thought was going to be is not what was going to be, but what was coming was going to be better than anything they could have dreamed of. And with Andrew... We had plans. We were adjusting. We were saying in the long term, he's going to come to this place. And now it's not just Andrew. It's the whole church. It's the whole staff. It's, it's everything. Uh, there's been a shaking and all that. We're all having to trust God. We're all having to say, okay, whatever you thought, it's not happening that way. I remember a few weeks ago, Pastor Marvin was up here, and he said, you want to make God laugh? Just tell him your plans. Tell him your plans and God will laugh because as you maybe think it's going to be, God can rearrange that and do something that he'd like to do with you. And we have to learn how to surrender to him, how to let him have his way. You know, the Bible says we make our plans. You know, you need to make your plans. We make our plans. But have in your mind totally, but yet God is going to order his steps. I remember when we were building here, and, and, and I'm grateful uh, for all that, that we've been able to do. But when we were building this second part, and we said all the land prep we were having to do, well, if we build again, we w didn't want to do land prep again. So if you look out there, you see the sidewalks that go around all this open ground. Well, that's where the next phase would be. That's where the next sanctuary would be. And we also built the parking lot for all that. So we did all the land prep. We built the parking lot and have the space. We're just waiting to put a building on it. Then COVID hit and changed everything. And suddenly everything's being rearranged and different things. Now we've got plans in Dagsboro and things. So we don't know. You know, God can change that also in a moment. But we're making plans with what we have. Yet God will order our steps. Well, here's the neat thing. So we built that parking lot in anticipation of, of that next thing. But guess what God had in, in store? When COVID hit, I can't tell you how many times that parking lot has now been filled with people. The food bank came and said, can we use it? Mount Air came and said, can we use it? Other groups have come and said, we use it. The state police have come and multiple times used our parking lot when they were doing the funeral for the, the policeman who was killed down in Del Mar. And they were headed to that. This is where they gathered. And they've done that a couple times now. Where they've gathered here and bring all the vehicles, all the emergency groups. Everybody was here, filled up every spot of our land and the road out here and the road on 104. And Norm, our, one of our security guys, said it was goosebumps when they gave the call and every emergency vehicle turned on their lights. And the place was packed, and the state police have come to us and said, if, we're ever, if we ever lose a, an officer down this side of, like Dover down, we would like to come here for the service. You know? <laughs> and the, the food bank, until this year, was meeting almost every, every few weeks right here. So I can't tell you how many times people have come in our door saying, I'm here as a guest of oh, the food bank because <laughs> they, they found out about us because they were coming for that help. So God had other plans. We, we made our plans, but yet God has ordered our steps in the same way. He's got a plan for Andrew, but he's ordering his steps through a path that none of us would vote for and none of us would choose. But I want you to see in the midst of the trial, what God's doing in our brother, 
what God's doing in my son. And uh, it's convicting to us just to watch his heart. And uh, as you hear this, I pray you hear it with a mindset of saying, Lord, what do you want to do with me? So here it is. Anyway, so if you don't know some basics, I have I have some notes uh, just about kind of what I'm going through. Uh, so you know why I'm not there in person. Uh, kind of like a symptom overview. It's loosely called uh, what, what I've been diagnosed with unofficially because they, they can't make it official, unfortunately. But it's multiple chemical sensitivity or environmental illness. Uh, essentially, I'm allergic to everything in life, which is really challenging. Uh, symptoms are like your traditional allergies, intestinal pain, nerve pain, joint pain, numbness, chronic sinus issues, chronic body inflammation, chronic fatigue, exhaustion, uh, allergic to all drugs. So if you can think of a drug, especially over-the-counter drugs, I'm allergic to all of them. Uh, severely weakened immunity system, uh, severe brain fog to any exposure, food sensitivities, heart issues, and and that's just a little bit of the list um, of things that are going on. So it's kind of surreal. So those are the bad things. The good things, I have a superpower. Little known fact about me. I have a superpower. Uh, it, with some of the chronic issues, it, it's actually pretty normal where you develop almost a super sense of smell. So if I, I got to choose a superpower, that might not be the top of my list. But I, but I have that now. I, I have super smell. And how that the application of that is if I walk in a grocery store, for example, and somebody has perfume on, I will smell that on my hands and my mouth. I will taste it once I get out of there. Uh, it, just for example, uh, recently, I went up to AI DuPont. Um, I'm pretty much quarantined, more or less, but I, so a former youth kid was dying. And and they, they had no Christian connection to any pastor except for me when they were in youth group years ago. And uh, what am I going to do? Not visit? And so so I went up there and it was fine for a while. And someone came in with perfume and I was stuck. Um, so I'm speaking with a dying kid. He actually did, just passed away this morning. Um, so I'm speaking with him and this person has perfume. And so how that affects me is I'm, I'm now driving home from, uh, I wasn't Christian. I'm sorry. It was AI DuPont. Uh, driving home and I am just covered in it. And I can smell it all over me, taste it like I'm, I'm just loopy. Uh, hard to remember what day it is, things like that, like that, that loopy. And you'll shower, do everything, change your clothes, and it's still on you. And you can't get it off. I can't use soap. Haven't used soap in a year. So it's good this is virtual. <laughs> uh, it's 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 really challenging. Uh, and that's just from, you know, one exposure to one person. Uh, and that would happen anytime I was at church. And I, I would put my hands up to someone. I'm like, do you smell this? This is so strong. And they can't smell anything. But it's but my sense is so, is so sensitive uh, or super powered uh, that it it just puts me in a challenging situation. So anyway, so that's that's kind of what I'm going through uh, day to day. It's just I, I really am just about allergic to everything uh, that that exists. Um, I have a ba- major Sussex County issue, so so I'm looking right out the window here about a stone's throw from where I'm at right now is a giant pile of chicken poop uh, that was dumped uh, here a while ago. I've had a miserable few weeks because it's just sitting there and I'm very allergic to it and and there's nothing I can do. So if I go outside, if we open doors, windows, uh, we have HEPA filters that change colors based on the quality of the air. And as soon as we open the doors, the quality of the air changes uh, because of the manure. And so, so it's, it just affects everything. Uh, and so that's, that's been the challenge for the last year. And then those things, they kind of snowball. And so when I was trying to be a tough guy, which is about a year ago, when I, when I uh, would preach for the weekends in February, I just wanted to tough it out. And it got so bad. It snowballs where if I have one exposure one day, and then I get to the next day and the next day, uh, it just gets worse and worse and worse symptomatically until you just feel like you're dying. And and that's where, you know, I remember my, my brother saw me after preaching the last time and I was ended up being at church almost every day for a two week stretch. And he just started crying when he saw me uh, once he realized just how bad uh, my body was. And and so it's been a process this last year trying to get better. And that's kind of, I guess, what the testimony is going to be about is, is just just so you guys know what my last year's kind of been like. And I, I have a whole bunch of scriptures. Maybe we'll get to them. Uh, but I do want you to just kind of understand what God's been doing. Uh, and to start that off, 
uh, I don't know if if anyone knows of Reese Howell's The Intercessor. Uh, that's a, a book I've read years and years ago. It's one of Dad's favorite books. Um, I had uh, read it after my kids were born. I know I went and reread it again. And there's just been this process, especially pr- probably since I got married. So that's seven years ago. Uh, around the time Eli started with five to ten, uh, it, it, around that time, this dying to self is what the intercessor teaches and preaches. And it's almost like a chapter by chapter breakdown of God teaching Reese Howes how to die to every aspect of his life. And that was so convicting. And honestly, the first time I read that, my impression was, Lord, don't call me to that. Call me to whatever you want. Just maybe not that because the the dying process is terrible. You look at each er- every, every area, I guess, of his life that he had to die to, and it's just like, oh, Lord, don't call me to that. Don't call me to that. I, d- I don't want to be quite like that just because it dying to self is all-encompassing, and it's so challenging. And, and so then, anyway, so that was my impression of it, and then things started happening in my life. And I started, uh, you know, sincerely, you know, telling God, giving God permission over every aspect of my life. You know, truly trying to, you know, live out the scriptures where where David's saying, hey, examine my heart. Show me, God. And, and you know, repeatedly, repeatedly just giving myself, dedicating myself to God. And so how that has looked in my life leading up to this, this sickness is I remember having... Uh, the, there was a process when we were, you know, after we were married, um, trying to have a baby. And um, in that time frame, our first baby, I remember seeing the heartbeat. Uh, there's nothing like seeing the heartbeat the first time. And it just melted my heart. You know, I was getting teary eyed. Couldn't believe there was a little miracle inside of my wife. And uh, in that process of, you know, learning to trust God, um, I had to let go of my wife. And so if you don't know, it's a, it's a much longer story. It's a testimony in itself, but we lost our first baby. And, and just a few days later, I didn't know if I was going to lose my wife. Uh, and, and I, the hospital was, was a very dramatic experience, you know, with the guys where we get that lump in our throat. Um, after the experience with my wife in the hospital, that lump didn't go away all day. I mean, I was just spent kind of emotionally, but I had a moment uh, where I was getting news about what happened in, in the surgery, and I got paged, um, you know, the hospital, the hospital speaker system, and they asked me to go to a place, and I get the, get the phone, and I, I you know, I assumed everything, you know, it was in regards to the bleeding and a miscarriage. I assumed everything was okay, and I had that doubt in my mind, and I remember getting past this phone, phone call, um, or the there was an actual phone, and I didn't know what, what they were going to say, and I had that question, Lord, it, it, like, am I going to lose my wife? You know, thinking oh, it's probably okay, but but it was as real to me, and I could see my future. It was it was it was a frozen moment in my life. I could see my whole future without my wife, and and I ended up at, at that time. I ha- held it, uh, waiting for the doctor to give me the news, and I just released my wife, like as sincerely as as I've ever released anything, and I let her go. And the news was good, and and it was. It was uh, an amazing process going forwards now is that I know God gave my wife back to me, but I had to release her. I had to be okay with losing her. Um, and so I learned to die to my wife, my kids. Oh, my goodness. So after that, we had two kids. It was in 2020 and 2021. So we had two kids uh, in that process. And I went back and read the book again. And so if you re- know anything about the book, it has a whole chapter dedicated to just dying and letting go of your kids. So I'm reading that. I tell my wife about it. And she wants nothing to do with that chapter. Let me tell you, <laughs> release it. Like there's, it's it's a challenging chapter for sure. And I'm just like Sarah, you got to release your kids. You know, and every pastor's wife wants their husband to preach at them. So I I, I would just Sarah, you got to do this. You know, this is what the Bible says. This is what Reese House says. Like you got to do it. And so in my mind, I'd release my kids. Um, but part of my the process and in reading the book, I just was having a prayer time late at night. Everybody else in the house was asleep and I'm just on my knees praying, Lord, help me to release. You know, I had a list of all these things. Lord, help these things to be released. And so I was covering ground I thought I had already covered. And so I, I you know, I know I've released material things and career things, financial things. I get to my wife, release my wife. And then I was praying, Lord, help me to release my kids. And I couldn't speak anymore. Um, 
and I ended up crying like I've never cried in my life, um, just sobbing, um, almost like a negotiation with God, um, begging for my kids to live. You know, I, I'd read enough stories about Christians and how God can use a trial like the loss of a child for his glory. And I didn't want to sign up for that. And so it was, it was, and I, I, I never experienced before it sounds, I've never really experienced anything like that. And, and for that half hour, I went through so many tissues because I got chronic, chronic sinus things, man. I was, whew, I went through so many tissues, just kind of begging God, talking to God. And, and it concluded, it was probably about 30 minutes or so with me just saying, God, I trust you with my kids. I'm um, get just the same thing I said about my wife, you know, Lord, I trust you with my kids. And it was such a real moment that I got up and and had to check to see if my kids were still breathing. Because I, I truly, I died to them like I gave them to God, you know, it, and that may sound strange, <laughs> um, but but it was so, so real that dying, that releasing, that letting go. Because, I mean, it, our control is imaginary anyway. You know, when we don't let something go, you don't have it in the first place. It's a deceit. And the devil doesn't want you to release it because once you release it, then God can give it back and then you can trust it. And so so I learned to die to my wife, learned to die to my kids. And I know Ed had some cool dates that he was sharing dramatic things. Well, mine is September 27th, 2022. Uh, and that that's when my, my heart uh, became a serious symptom. And and I was, uh, if you don't know, I'll do, do the abbreviated version of that, but I was playing softball and my heart took off. And and I, I thought it would just everything be good, um, not really have an issue. And then uh then everything, you know, it 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 not only did not go away, but it just, man, this this thing was coming out of my chest. And I had a heart monitor as part of my 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 eye watch and it was glitching so it was giving me all kinds of numbers and i ended up calling Kay bennett and she's like yeah that's pretty serious why don't you go to the hospital but i thought it would go away any second so i kind of took my time i had someone else come pick me up and the you know, long story short uh i did an ekg on my watch figured out how to do that and it was 221 was where my heart was stuck um and i've talked to dr sense and they're like you could have died you could have died i was like i know it felt like i was dying <laughs> Um, and in that process, we, we start driving and then I'm, you know, I'm realizing just how serious it is. And we call my wife, called my mom. And by the time I got done with my, talking to my mom, I, I couldn't really speak anymore. Uh, it, it felt like somebody was sitting on my chest and, and it was my father-in-law who's a vet who was driving me and we were talking, you know, and it's just like, what would happen to me? And it's just like, I would just, I would just blank out. Um, and so once I seriously started thinking about my last words and I could just think of, I love you, I love you, I love you, you know, tell my kids, you know, it's tell Sarah and, and, and it got that serious. Then I did the same thing I did with my wife, the same thing that I did with my kids. And it was Lord, you know, it's just in my own head. I just closed my eyes and just like, Lord, I trust you, whatever your will is with my life. If this is it, I'm okay. Your will be done. And I was at the light in Harbison. If you know where the Royal Farms is in Harbison, um, that's one of my favorite places now. <laughs> because we hit that light and this warmth came over my whole body, head to toe. I could breathe again. And it, it was, you know, it was the process of, again, dying to, to self. And I, I had to, I don't know why God's doing it the way he's doing it. Um, but it was my wife. It was my kids. It was myself, you know, truly releasing all those things. And and so this past year has been releasing and dying to everything else. And then sometimes we, you know, we'll joke. And it's just like, what else is there to die to? And unfortunately, there are more things. <laughs> but, but it's just like, Lord, what else is there? And I know, uh, you know, like the ministry, you know, Eli's, uh, Pastor Eli has been able to take over the young adult ministry. Well, I had just started in January had no other responsibilities and I could just go full into young adult ministry. And I was so excited about it because um, I'd been in charge of the young adults for a long, long time, but I always had other responsibilities. And so I couldn't, you know, it was pretty much one day a week I could focus on young adult ministry. 
And so then I was, it's like everything was taken out, taken away. Other responsibilities were gone. I could be a young adult pastor. I was so excited about it, had, you know, plans and visions for it. And within a month of really being intentional in the month of January, we doubled our group size. And so we're planning, okay, where, where do we move to? What other places can, can house us in the church? And we're planning those things. And then everything shut down. And and it was so hard, even in September. And so I, I was kind of half in, half out for most of the year. And in September, I I just had to had to release it, um, kind of for the good of the group. And it's it's hard when you're making plans. Uh, podcasting was another one. Trying to do something when I was in isolation, and I, I got so sick, I I couldn't even do what I'm doing now, and and sit here and record myself. I couldn't do it. Um, couldn't have the tech guys in the room, couldn't be with uh, another person. And so we had to shut down all my ideas. Every plan and idea I had for last year for ministry died. Uh, and I had to, you know, had to watch it happen and, and relationships you pour into. I, I can't, you know, it's so difficult to meet with people face to face anymore. And and so you have to die to what you feel like God wants you to do. And that added to a lot of confusion trying to sort it out. Like, why would God want me to lose ministry, to lose influence, to lose impact? You know, I'm missing, missing weddings where people are asking me to do weddings. I can't, uh, you know, I, it's, it's kind of breaking my heart to, to lose that investment. And you ask those questions, well, God, why, what's your, what's your thought process here? And, and so I ended up chasing why for a long time. And that's, that's a rabbit hole. There's no need to go down. The question is, do you trust God? Not why something happens. Do you trust God? Uh, you know, we can't handle the why anyway. God's bigger than us. He 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 knows the reason why things are happening, but we can't handle that. Maybe he can give us a little snippet in certain ways he does, but chasing the why doesn't matter. Do you trust him? And sometimes he'll give you a whole bunch of whys to see if you do. He will test you. Uh, anyway, I'm getting preaching now. <laughs> uh, so other things we've had to die to. Uh, possessions, you know, possessions that they have that saying, you know, you don't want your possessions to possess you. Well, let me tell you, it's really easy when you lose them all. They don't possess me now. Uh, (laughs) how that happened is they found mold in the house. And so there's a couple symptoms that were specific to, to, to mold toxicity. So we, so we know that was an issue and they treated it in June. We were hoping that was the only issue when we found out that that simply wasn't the case. Um, but anyway, so there was mold. They treated it in June. The I think it was a day or two after Esther was born. So our our perfectly timed baby for such a time as this, like just a, a wonderful gift from God, is is little Esther. But the day or two after the hospital visit, they they were spraying for mold, and it's like, hey, you got to be out of the house for about two hours. Everything else will be be fine. So I go, it's all right, cool. Um, see you in a couple hours, and we'll go back to the house. And since that spray happened, I cannot be in the house anymore. Um, it makes no sense. So, so right now, if I went over to, to my house, it makes me sick. Anyone else on earth can be in that house except for me. And it makes no sense. Why would this spray that is, and we've done everything we can to air it out, clean it out. It, it should not be affecting me, but I cannot be in the house anymore. And so all, all the possessions that are in the house have, have that chemical or, or, you know, former mold spores or whatever. So I, I can't, all my possessions died that day. Um, and we didn't, you know, I'm glad I didn't know about it ahead of time. So I couldn't poo poo it and, you know, be all Eeyore about the situation. It was just, you know, it happened and you deal with it. it it's hard because we're trying to move some things out and then you realize, oh, I had that possession. Now I'm sad. <laughs> you know, you realize what you lost. But it's, you know, when you die to everything else, you know, I, I get to stay. So I'm at my parents' house now. I get to be here with my kids. I could have lost my kids. I could have lost my wife. I could have lost me. How how could I be ungrateful? Even if it's, you know, you can imagine the situations that arise from three kids under three. And we we live in essentially one room and I can't be in there because it makes me sick. Um, You know, so it's it's challenging, but I'm so grateful in, in the midst of that. And obviously, you know, for Sarah and I, all the plans and dreams that we had. Who knows? You know, maybe they're dead. <laughs> maybe God's going to let us let them go and maybe they'll come back. We, we, we don't know. But that's things we've had to die to. The, the hardest thing is actually coming up uh, next month, which is we're, we're leaving Delaware to continue the detox for at least at least two months. 
Um, maybe, maybe more like we, we we're coming to a point of Delaware. I, I know I'm allergic to Delaware. Um, and multiple doctors have talked to me. Uh, if, if you have kind of regular allergies, there's the two worst states in America to be in for regular allergies is Maryland and Delaware. Also known as Delmarva. <laughs> this is uh, so. If you have allergies, this is this part of life when you're on Delmarva, and and that's based on pollen measurements. Uh, and and tree pollen, we're we're just about the worst place in America, probably the worst place for tree pollen on Delmarva. And so the doctors knew that, and they said you, you're just you're not going to be able to detox in Delaware. Uh, and and by the, that detox, when I say that, it is a multi month, you know. Three to six months for sure, if not, you know, a year plus. And so they, they've they told me I can't do it in Delaware, but our life is here. Our roots are here for generations. Uh, our kids, um, you know, to isolate them for me going away. Like, we just don't have a good solution. And so we know for sure during pollen season, we just can't be here. Um, it's, it's very complicated to do that. But, you know, do we have to die to all of our Delaware dreams? I don't I don't know. And so that's that's hard. Uh, and we we just we simply don't know we're, we're going out west um, just because the environmentally it's significantly better. I have the list of all the desert states that they've recommended. So that's uh, western Texas and New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Nevada um, and parts of California. And so that's where they say I have to go to detox. Um, and that's just kind of breaking in our hearts to do that. And then so so, of course, the questions is, you know, will I ever be able to to be in Delaware. You know, we have a lot and, and, um, a a one acre lot next to mom and dad's and we can build, but can we even live if we build, um, you know, what is that, what does that look like? And so there's those kind of challenges, but when they come up, when a hard thing happens, if, if, you know, Ed has a car crash, if, if other things that does the Bible change when we go through a trial, It, it never does. That's what the promises are for you know, for these hard times. And man, these lessons have been coming so quickly and, and so fast. I wouldn't trade it for anything. So my, not, that means my current circumstances, I'm, I'm not telling you this so you feel bad. You know, I'm telling you this so you, so you know what, what's happening and that you can go through terrible things, hardships. You know, I, I know there's people listening. You're going through so much stuff that I wouldn't want to be in your spot. So whatever trial we're going through, understand God is in it and he's going to use it. And it's going to be powerful. Why? Because he's not going to waste the trial. That's not who your God is. He is with you and he wants to use it for a purpose, even unto death. You know, we don't have guarantees, but what we do have is Romans 8, 28, which says what? All things will work together for the good, including whenever you leave this world. And we get the upgrade when that happens anyway. You know, it's this, the new body. (laughs) Uh, Abigail, I didn't plan on sharing this. But Abigail, has, she's three, and she's we, we found a cat on the side of the road that was no longer living. Uh, and so, she, what happened to the black cat? And so, we're talking about death. And and she's, you know, I, I tell her, it's like, no, the cat died. Is Jesus going to raise the cat from the dead? It's like, well, Jesus could, but probably not. You know, everything dies. It's okay. And then she looks at me, and she has, her eyes start to water, and she looks up at Daddy. Am I going to die? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> just like heartbreaker. And so then I explain all about Jesus. And it's like, guess what heaven is? And she's been so obsessed with heaven. And she's she is ready for her new body because she's going to be so strong. And she's just like, oh, and in her prayers, she's like, I can't wait to go to heaven. And she lists people in her family who passed away. And it's like, and they love me. And and so she, she's so fascinated with, with death and heaven, and it's just like, but we get older and we lose the fascination. You know, we get older and we death is now this terrible thing, and we don't really live out the scripture that to die is gain. We actually don't believe that when we get older. Well, we have too much to lose. You have everything to gain. Read what the, the Bible says. So anyway, uh, the past year I've just I've learned so much. So I want to. Oh man, I have a whole bunch of points, and I don't know if I'll get to any of them. Uh, we'll talk, I guess the spiritual stuff when I first got, you know, I, I say diagnose, I've, I've, I went up to UPenn and they say, yeah, we believe you that all this has happened. We've seen loosely this before. And the lady, a wonderful doctor actually sat me down 
and said, so just so you know, we cannot officially diagnose you with anything. And I was like, that's fine. Just give me a piece of paper that says I'm not making it up. And she's like, we, we can't do that. We can't officially diagnose you with anything. We can't officially treat you in any way because of where the medical science is. There's no uniform way of treatment or testing. So officially, we believe you, but we can't prove anything. And it's like, what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> so it's been so hard where you're chasing the medical things and you kind of get spit out by the medical industry. Um, I did get one doctor who said we can maybe try some treatments, but officially you're just going to be diagnosed with a stress disorder because you have to be diagnosed with something. And it's like, it's not a stress disorder. Uh, uh, anyway, so so the medical stuff has been challenging. And so once you get spit out by that, where where do you have to go? It, it's, you know, the the spiritual focus was so kind of primary in my mind. And that taught me so much because you have to ask these spiritual questions and and about sickness, about pain, about suffering. And I've read, I was trying to count them up last night. It's past years, probably 50 plus books, something like that. Um, audiobooks, because I'm allergic to all paper, <laughs> um, any paper or anything printed, my Bible, I'm allergic to all those things. I can't, I can't have any of those things. Uh, but audiobook, hey, I'm a I'm a great reader when it comes to audiobooks. And I, I went through so many books, I even reading uh, kind of things from certain denominations or or ministers that I wouldn't agree with, but I don't have the answers. I, I can't tell people answers to what's going on with me. And so I was open to listening to, and hearing things. And you know, every Christian wants to have the answers to why the bad things are happening and what to do about it. And we all want answers, but I've definitely learned there's so many wrong ones out there. And and I, I don't have time to go into to all that, but my goodness, there's some really bad answers when people get sick. Um, and I, to me, that matters because when we get sick, that's when our light shines the brightest to people. You know, a lot of you really want to pay attention to what I was saying today. Why? Because I'm sick. It gives me a platform now. Uh, you know, and it and it matters to be. It can draw people in, and so if you get the terrible news, the dramatic news that you never want to hear, well, understand your light's going to shine brighter now. And so it's important that we understand and seek out who God is, His character, when we're in the middle of the storm, so we can represent Him better. And so some of the the books, oh my goodness, D. L. Moody, E. M. Bounds, Watchman Nee, Andrew Murray, Charles Spurgeon uh, had some stuff just a couple of days ago. Oh fantastic teachings about what you do when you're suffering. Uh, and, and again, there's some really bad ones. And I, man, it's a, I feel like there's so many sermons in that, uh, that I don't want to get too distracted in, but, uh, just, there's a lot of poor teaching out there, especially in healing ministries. Um, I'm not poo-pooing all healing ministries, but a great many of them, uh, just teach some, some poor things. Um, about God and about who he is, and they don't heal that many people. And I wouldn't call myself a healing ministry uh, unless unless you're like Jesus and healing people. Um, so anyway, I've learned a lot there. Uh, learned a lot. My goodness. Pastor, I, I, I text Pastor Ken earlier and uh, today, and marriage. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I've learned so much about marriage and what it's supposed to do, because uh, because bad things, exposure of a bad thing is a good thing. And when you go through a trial, it exposes so much bad things. Um, and so when you're married to someone and bad things are getting exposed, that's that can be challenging. And so for, for me and for Sarah, this has been such a, our marriage has been such a trial by fire kind of year. And, and I understand why you know, going through hard things can can rip marriages apart. Um, I, I get that because there's there's been plenty of avenues where that could happen. But when I was single, I had a pretty consistent prayer. And that was, God, I don't want to get married unless it's your best for me. And that's it. it. It has to be the best of what your plan is. And so that means I wanted a marriage that wasn't just a regular marriage. I wanted God's best for me. And so it meant I was single for a long time. I told God... Um, I guess I told God I, when the prayer, I felt like I had an agreement with him uh, that he would bring me my wife. I'm not going to date anybody. I'm going to, I'm going to know I'm going to marry this person before we ever dated. And that ended up happening. Um, and I, I'm, I'm so grateful th that it did. Um, 
But if I wanted that kind of marriage, it has to be tried by fire. You want to be a great pastor? Do you want to be the best pastor? You better expect the best of God's trials. <laughs> you, you're not going to get some normal run-of-the-mill life if you're going to give, dedicate your life to God. It's not going to happen. Which character in the Bible didn't go through trials? What was that? <laughs> like, that's everybody. Every, I was just reading through Joseph. Are you kidding me with Joseph? My goodness. You know, he was praying when he's in that pit. And the prayer, was, it wasn't answered, but he's praying in the pit. And he gets into slavery and he's sold in slavery and he's praying. Does it, you know, what got him thrown into prison? His righteousness. And he's praying in that prison. He's alone for years. He's begging for help. He talks to the, he's interpreting the dream and he's saying, just remember me. Remember me. I'm stuck here in prison. I've asked God countless times. I can't figure this out. But God was preparing. He uses the trial to prepare, to teach. And, and if you had the view of, well, the devil's doing this, that wasn't the devil doing that to Joseph. That was God. God was in the trial, not the devil. The devil's in the trial, then deal with the devil. But every trial is not courtesy, oh, Satan's got me. No, he doesn't. He could, so, so, so make, make sure you're not the one, you know, your sin's causing you all these problems. That can happen. I'm not saying it can't. But many times, especially for the Christian, if you are sincere, then God has to bring the test. He has to. Otherwise, he doesn't love you. When the, who does the discipline come to? The one that he loves. That's why the trial comes to a Christian, because if he loves you, then, then he, he wants what's best for you. He's going to shape and develop you, and, and certain things can only happen through trials. In fact, all of the best things happen through trials. And you see what the world does when we go through a trial? Oh, I feel so bad for you. That must be so hard. Such a, ch oh no, poor, th no. You know what, uh, what was it? Charles Spurgeon, this is what he said about trials. I congratulate you. <laughs> because it's a position of honor. And, and you know, I, you don't need to send me congratulation letters in the mail, but, uh, you know, that <laughs> we're in that same position now is that when we go through something hard, if we're doing it for God, if we're honoring God in the midst of the hardship and the trial, it is something to be celebrated. I, I don't have a boring life right now. <laughs> I'm going through it. But God is using it. He's using the pressure, the challenge, the, 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 the fight that we're in. I want to be a good pastor, not a regular one. I don't, and and I, I want to be the best of whatever God's called me to do. And I, I can't see what that's going to turn into right now. But God's going to use it. He's not wasting what I'm going through. So anyway, to summarize, uh, Eli, do I, what do I, what do I have, like four minutes? Is that, the, is that the right math? You had to give to allow people to ask questions. Okay. Uh, so uh, one, that Romans 8, 28, just understand that's for your trials. It's not for your perfect days. It's for the bad ones. Understand uh, that, that idea that things work for the good. I know God's going to use it. Just don't ask me how, because I don't know. Uh, I, I can't I can't see that. I, I wish, you know, the idea of walking by faith, part of my prayers for a long time, especially the first path part of the year, was like, all right, yes, that's fine, walking by faith and everything. But I'd prefer vision. I'd prefer to walk by sight. That's easier. Uh, and so if I don't have the sight right now, I, so don't ask me how God's going to use it. I don't know. I don't even know where I'm going to be, you know, in a month. Uh, we're, 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 we don't even know when we're going to leave, uh, how long we're going to be, wherever. We're, like, there's so many things we just don't know. And that's okay. We're walking by faith right now. Um, and, and we know Romans 8, 28 applies when you're walking by faith. Uh, I have been over, I wish I had more time for this one, but I, I have been overwhelmed by blessings. Absolutely overwhelmed. I can't tell you what a amazing joy our daughter is, Esther Joy. Oh my goodness. Uh, what a blessing from God in the middle of this trial. Uh, family, my uh, my older brother, he works nights um, at, at Redner's and he knows the challenge that we're in. And so all these sicknesses and symptoms try being a kind of a stay-at-home dad with three kids, three and under, and having no help. And we need Sarah to, to work um, she's a counselor. We 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 need we have to have her working. So I'm no doesn't matter how sick I am, 
I am in charge of three kids, three and under all the time. Um, and so my brother has been like literally every, like he loves working nights because he can get down to office night shift and he helps us. He brings food all the time. Um, you know, it's just, it's unreal. All his free moments, um, you know, he's there. And so we, I've seen so many people sacrifice the church. Uh, there's so many people who've, who've kind of helped us with, with these, just giving us money. Um, you know, being sick like this is expensive, and we didn't know, you know, we're going month to month trying to to make the the bills work. And we've been able to pay off every bill at the end of the month. And we've had family members just give us checks, um, church people that you know, um, you know, give us checks. We've had people I don't know, anonymous people. And we've always had just enough to, to make do. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm not saying help us, we're broke. That's what I'm, what I am saying is God's using the financial pressure to shape me too. You know, it's hard when we're doing the math and it's like, okay, what do we have to do? Trust God. So if someone had a million dollars, don't tell me you have a million dollars because God's shaping us. Um, he's using the financial hardship and the trial and, and we're learning that we can be okay. And uh, hey, I'm a travel person and my goodness, you know how cool it is? Um, I'm isolated and I, I don't get to go anywhere, but even being sick, I went to, a, I went to what, 27 states last year. 27 states, all for sick reasons and visiting different places. But, and I tried barbecue in like half of those states. It was amazing. <laughs> uh, you know, it's so good. I have, if, if anyone's barbecue wise, I have some opinions about that. I, that's a different time. I can tell you where the good barbecue is in America. Uh, so I, I, anyway, and, and going back to the context of dying to self, I'm alive. And it's, it's so hard for me to get down and depressed. It can happen. It only happens when I've, I've, I remove God from my situation. If you want to get depressed, remove God from your situation. You want a cure for your depression? Bring God back. Understand who he is. And then your trial, you know, it's not so bad. And just one, let's, one scripture, Eli. All right. Yeah, then, I'm, yeah. then I'll drop out of this. Um, this is just one that's resonated with me. First Peter 4, 19. So this, this hurts some of the healing ministry doctrines that I've been to. Um, and I've heard and I've read, this kind of is an affront to that. But it's 1 Peter 4, 19. And it says, therefore, let those who suffer, here's the big part, according to the will of God. So do you know you can suffer according to the will of God? That means it is God's purpose and design for suffering. This is like me disciplining my kid. Yes, you're in time out. It is my design for you to suffer right now for your good. That God loves us, so he disciplines us, and it can be his will for you to suffer, and that's okay. And then it says, commit their souls to him. So that means when you're in the middle of suffering, you're in a trial, you're in hardship, you have a job to do. Give all that you are to him. Give it to him. And in, in doing good as a faithful creator, which is saying that we need to then, what do you do in the trial? Are you angry? Are you mean? No, you do good. Do good. And so essentially be the clay. That's all right. Trust him and do good. Um, it's, it's, it's done wonders. And, and so I, again, I'm, I'm just, I'm endlessly blessed because I'm in this trial. And the only time, again, I think differently is when I take God out of it. And I think the whole time he's speaking and sharing that, he's got the word grateful behind him. Grateful. You know, I think about everything that God did in my life, the pressures, the problems, the things I had to deal with, and the things that were in me that, I, that I've seen God use, that I grew up in a, in a family business, that in that there were certain pressures and things, and yet God called me in that place and then uh, taught me in that place, put, put me in places where I had to trust God and I, I wanted to hear from God. And so I had an excitement about business. I had an excitement about growth. I had excitement about God's plan and purposes and, and, and then the pressure of, of where he took me, trials that I would go through. And now, 
at Crossroad for the last 20 years, I've seen God use all of that, that he was preparing me for something, for what happened here when people say, wow, how was all this going to happen? But yet I saw God had, had been planning early on and using things and, and, and taking you through something so you could be the right person at the right time. But how many of you know, Crossroad doesn't need another Rick Betts. It doesn't need another Rick Betts. And, and, and if it is Andrew, and we were had plans that it would be Andrew, uh, but, but whoever it is does not need to go through what I went through. God has already used that for its purposes and its plans. Whoever's coming next, there's a whole other thing going on. You can see our world is changing. Christians are the problem. The world is starting to hate believers and saying they are the problem. And and what is what are we going to need? We're going to need people who can be under pressure and yet stand up for God. We're going to need people that that, that when the world tells you to be quiet that we still speak up. We're going to need people who say if you don't bow down, we're going to put you in the fire. Well, whether he spares me or not, put me in the fire. I'm going to serve God. We, we got to have a mentality for where we are going. And, uh, and I see God doing that with, with Andrew because the things I was going through, and some in leadership, some in, 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 in growth, some in churches and all that, I go, Andrew's not been through that kind of pressure you know he's he's with this staff which is incredible and and working with us and I go so Lord what what's uh, going to make that I was talking with Pastor Eli when he went through boot camp with for the Marines and he said they had a, a time called hell week and it was when they put in all the pressure it was kind of the culmination of all that and I said, yeah, and I said, that's probably greater than, than like Army's boot camp because in the Marine boot camp, they're looking for a little bit more and they put you under more pressure. And I said, but if you go on to SEAL Team 6, only one out of 100 Marines make it there because they really turn up the pressure, but boy, you've got a soldier when it's over. Come on, do you understand? And, and how many of you know, sometimes God wants a, a believer that's a, that's a SEAL Team 6, and you got to put him under more pressure. And, and so things are going on like that. What's God going to do with Andrew? I, I don't know. How's he going to get him to, to that place? I don't know. But I know this. We're trusting God. And, and with all the, the, the changes and with all the things that everybody connected, our family, friends, the church that is going through with this, we're all learning something and growing and having to be more dedicated and focused on what do you want, Lord, because we need to yield to you. So here's what I know. As Andrew was sharing, God was speaking. And there's conviction in this place. And whatever God said to you, pay attention. Because Palm Sunday is about God offering peace. God offering a better way. Before everything changed. Before they lost everything. And so this is our moment of peace. Even trials... He's got peace in the midst of his trial. He's got a way, and he's going to get somewhere that God has purposed and planned that he could have never have done without the trial. And what about us? Like Andrew said, some of you are going through stuff right now. Have you got your eyes on him? Are, are you like those Hebrew boys? You know, Whether he spares me, whether he slays me, I'm going to serve God with all that I am to yield yourself to its highest level. I have no doubt that people have been convicted. I have no doubt that people have been asked by God, give me more. Take something out of the way and let me be in charge. And the, the only question is, is our answer yes. Will we receive the king on the donkey? Will you stand? I'm hoping uh, that while he's out west that we will get uh, another sermon, maybe a, 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 a bunch of little mini sermons at different locations that he is. We'll see if he's able to, to pull that off. But be praying for him and Sarah and the family that God will do 
what he wants to do. And now for us. Somebody's probably here that knows Jesus is not Lord of your life. You've been in charge. He's not had his way. You've had your way. And he's asking. He's offering peace one more time. To let him be totally in charge. And he's waiting on the answer. Yes or no. But if the answer is yes and you're willing, I can lead you in a prayer of you committing your heart, your life to the living God. Your brothers and sisters that are here that understand it, they will support you. They'll be glad for you. They'll say the prayer with you. But you have to be bold in front of men and women and be willing to confess Christ, to raise that hand for everybody to see and say, Pastor Rick, it's me. It's time for him to be totally in charge of my life as my Lord and Savior. If that's you today, brother, sister, be bold. Raise that hand, and we'll say this prayer with you. Anybody need that prayer today? Raise your hand up high, and we will say this prayer with you. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. Right here, sis. Right back there. Back there, sis. Right here. Back there. Over here. Where? Right there. I can't see it, but there you go. Right down here. Amen. Right there, sis. Back there. All the way in the back. I see the hand all the way in the back. Amen. Amen. Got a few hands over there. Ushers, you're going to be busy. Anybody else? I saw a bunch of hands on this. What's happening? This whole wedge is getting saved. That's what's going on. What's happening over here? What's happening over here? Anybody else? I guess uh, Andrew's anointing of what God was doing is heavier on that side of the building. I don't know. Did I miss anybody over here? All right. So, wow. Okay, I'm going to speak over here to this wedge then. <laughs> We're going to say this prayer. I don't know. God knows why you raised your hand. Our ushers would like to be able to put some packets in your hand, so they've got to identify with you. Those that really, you, God's moved your heart, would you raise your hand so the ushers can see who raised their hands? Do it right now. Those that, that, that are ready to make this commitment, okay, ushers, just position yourself. Don't, don't do the packets yet, and I see the hand back there. All right, let's say this prayer with them. Let's support them. God knows why, why you've raised your hand, but let's say this, dedicate our hearts to him right now. Dear Lord, I thank you for today. The words I've heard... You have used them to draw me to yourself. So right now, in front of all these witnesses, I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. Come live in me. Thank you for dying for my sin and removing them out of the way. I turn from those sins and choose to live for you. Holy Spirit, come and fill me. Teach me the ways of Jesus that I might follow after him all the days of my life. And it's according to your word that as I do this, I can confess by faith that I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen and amen and amen. <laughs> Woo. All right, ushers, now you can try to get the packets in their hands. You can get the packets in their hands. Amen. And the packets they passed out, it has helps in, in this new walk with the Lord. Uh, but we also, right over here, I see Pastor Ken and Lynn right up here in the corner. They want to pray with you. Everybody who raised their hand. Please make sure you come up here and speak with Pastor Ken and Lynn. They want to pray with you. They want to invest in that decision. If you don't have a home church, you got one right here if you want it. But every single one of us say, welcome to the family, guys. Welcome to the family. Ooh, and now for the rest of us. I, listen, I'm expecting you to have a good week. Not to waste your seven days. I'm expecting the Lord to do something in our lives before we get back here. When we say we have seven days, we're simply saying, what are we going to do between now and coming back? We don't live our life by accident. We live it by purpose. We have a purpose. We have been called to this world to be uh, the, the evangelists, to be able to be the messengers of the Lord and to be able to share the gospel. 
So that's our call. Let's live that life. Let, let them see this in you. I don't know about you, but every time Andrew speaks, I see what God's doing with him. I feel uh, the power of what God is building there. And, and, and I'm waiting for that day it's able to be released out on this world again and that he can stand here without reactions to what you're wearing. <laughs> and God can use him, but right now he can use you because you're going to go all over this place called Delmarva and let the world see Jesus in you. Let the Holy Spirit lead the path. Be bold, be brave, and be able to speak and live and do and be the lights, and let's come back with a testimony on our lips about the goodness of God in our lives. Amen. Well, Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for convicting hearts, because I know you have. Lord, every time it reveals what you're doing in my son, it still draws me closer to you. So, Lord, thank you for doing that with this congregation. You put Andrew in this congregation for a plan and a purpose. And we thank you for stirring us up today. So, Lord, as we go out these next seven days, may it be a powerful week for us. May we live the gospel. May the power of the Holy Spirit be moving in each one of us. And may we see it and to be able to give you honor and glory for everything you do. And, Lord, so thank you for my brothers and sisters. Uh, may we love one another like you have loved us. And may your heart be glad for what you see in your sons and daughters. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, amen.